Uh, this is Brad Duncan. Brad Duncan specializes in network traffic analysis and exploit kit detection. After more than 21 years of classified intelligence work for the U.S. Air Force, Brad transitioned into cybersecurity in 2010. He's currently a threat intelligence analyst for Palo Alto Networks Unit 42. Brad is also a volunteer handler for the Internet Storm Center and has posted more than 80 diaries at isc.sans.edu. He routinely blogs technical details and analysis of infection traffic at malwaretrafficanalysis.net, which if you haven't seen that, it's an awesome resource. So we're glad to have Brad here. Cool. Thank you. All right. He just went over all that, so I won't uh, go into it other than uh, uh, my current job at Palo Alto Networks allows me uh, plenty of latitude to post samples of uh, traffic analysis and uh, the PCAPs and malware samples on my blog. So we're going to look at uh, exploit kits in April 2017. Uh, the original title of this it was called uh, Exploit Kits and Indicators of Compromise. However, I find I tend to update this thing every time I do it to where it's almost a completely different um, presentation by the time I give it uh, in about three, four months time. However, some parts are still fairly static, like uh, what an exploit kit is, looking at an exploit kit ecosystem. Uh, uh, those things, the introductory parts, are things that we, uh, uh, that don't really change because we're talking about concepts. Everything else tends to evolve over time. And um, the last time I gave this in a public forum was in uh, B-Sides Augusta, and the presentation has changed significantly since then. So to understand exploit kits, you have to understand that there are two strategies to distribute malware. Now, the first strategy requires some sort of user action. The user, you must do something in order to get yourself infected with malware that's somehow being uh, distributed to you that makes it uh, uh, in your hands. The most popular way of malware distribution is through mass emails, malicious spam is what we call it. And in many times you'll have an attachment or you'll have a link that you'll download an attachment. And in this case, this is from uh, Monday of this past week. I believe it was distributing uh, uh, dry decks or something like that. This one uh, is pretty ingenious because it involves a um, passcode that you actually have to type into a, a, a Word document, a password protected Word document. Several steps there that you got to do to get yourself infected. And then once the infection happens, you know exactly how it happened because it was something you took part in. Here's another uh, uh, thing about the first strategy. Uh, another method is the pop-up web browser windows that ask you to install stuff like your Java is out of date or your Flash Player is out of date. And at best, you're looking at some unwanted programs or adware or something along the lines. At worst, you're looking at uh, some sort of actual information stealer or ransomware infection. Although, in this example, if you were to download and install a video player setup file from chucklefunhead.com, I would argue that you deserve what you get. <laughs> <laughs> With this first strategy, there usually is plenty of warning that your, uh, uh, what you're doing will have negative consequences. Uh, for example, that uh, chucklefunhead.com file You'll get a little warning saying, do you want to run or save it? The stock file will harm your computer. Um, the Word document in that previous email, it has a malicious macro, and there's always a security warning for uh, default installations of Microsoft Office. They do not enable macros by default. So you get a little pop-up that will say, are you sure you want to do this? But the second strategy is when the malware authors uh, in trying to distribute their malware try and do it behind the scenes and you're none the wiser. You don't, you, you're doing regular routine internet browsing activity and somehow your computer gets infected and you don't know why. And that is the concept 
behind exploit kits where you take a criminal group's malware to an average user's computer and you do it behind the scenes. Now when we're talking about exploit kits, uh, you must understand that exploit kits distribute malware targeting systems running Microsoft Windows. Um, that's not to say that other platforms don't get targeted by malware, they just don't get targeted by malware in this particular fashion. To fully understand what a uh, exploit kit is, you must first define a vulnerability in an exploit. And we'll do that here right now. A vulnerability is a flaw, basically. A flaw that somebody can take advantage of. So the definition up here says an unintended flaw in software code that leaves it open to exploitation in the form of unauthorized access or malicious behavior. Kind of a wordy definition to say, hey, this is a flaw that somebody can take advantage of and do stuff that they shouldn't be able to do. Vulnerabilities are generally cataloged by CVE number, Common Vulnerability and Exposures uh, Database. This one is CVE 272995. Now it's only April and uh, this has been out for a little while. So uh, almost, I'm sure there's over 3,000, by, well over 3,000 by now. Vulnerabilities have been cataloged in the first four months of this year alone. This one's about Adobe uh, Flash Player, version 24.0.0.194. Um, I love these definitions because what they say is successful exploitation could lead to arbitrary code execution. There's nothing arbitrary about the code that's executed whenever these are successfully exploited. It's just a way of saying we don't know what type of code your computer could be hit with. They should say malicious code execution, but uh, they say arbitrary. So an exploit is a file or a piece of code that actually does um, the exploitation, taking advantage, it takes advantage of a vulnerability. Um, exploits by themselves, although they are malicious, they are not in and of themselves harmful to your computer. And uh, I'll explain what I mean here. So um, earlier this week, I got an example of rig exploit kit infecting a uh, host in my lab and I can go through the PCAP of the traffic and I can extract the, uh, uh, the flash exploit that was used in this infection. I can take that out and it's malicious code. Your antivirus uh, should be able to detect this and uh, especially now it's been out for a few days um, and uh, we'll probably delete it from your system. However, if you had that code, you could click on it, you could do whatever, it won't work just as a file that's sitting on your computer. It has, to be, it has to be specifically utilized within the construct of an exploit kit. So exploits, yeah, they're bad, but uh, they're not uh, inherently um, nuclear or dynamite or handled with care. They're, uh, they're just part of a bigger, uh, um, a bigger mechanism. So this is probably the best definition of exploit kits. Um, that doesn't use the word kit in the definition. A server-based framework that uses exploits to take advantage of vulnerabilities in browser-based applications to infect a client, which we mean a desktop or laptop, or a server if it's being used as a client, I've seen that happen before, uh, without the user's knowledge. What are some of the vulnerabilities that exploit kits target? What do you suppose? We're talking browser-based applications, so uh, what's one of the biggest ones out there right now? Flash. Flash is uh, still the big one, uh, even though, even though um, I don't really see anything along the lines of zero days for Flash, at least uh, the last one I remember that found its way into uh, the exploit kit scene was uh, about uh, a year and two or three months ago. I want to say February 2016, uh, some time around the early part of the year, there was a, an actual zero day that had about 24 hours out in the wild uh, that even if your uh, machines were specifically patched 
uh, and fully up to date, there was a 24 hour window where exploit kits were able to use that and infect computers. The browser, the browser itself is a browser based application and that is probably the second biggest thing that gets targeted or hit when I'm testing exploit kits in my lab. Um, Microsoft Edge, Internet Explorer are the two big ones that you'll see uh, vulnerabilities out in the CVE list for at this point in time. I haven't been able to successfully infect a computer using exploit kits while I've been using Chrome. Um, I know that there have been some Firefox vulnerabilities uh, for a while, but uh, I generally don't even use that anymore in my test environment. Silverlight is another application, browser-based application, that uh, I've seen exploits for. And in the past, we used to see a lot of Java and PDF exploits up through about uh, 2014, 2015. After about 2015, sometime during that year, we uh, really stopped, uh, stopped seeing them. There are some exploit kits that actually still use these exploits. Um, one of them is called Kaizen. That's a, uh, um, that I've seen generally uh, associated with websites that uh, are in South Korea. And I want to say it's a Chinese actor behind it. But that's, uh, that's one of those where I actually have to regress to a much earlier, even more out of date machine in order to get infected through Kaizen Exploit Kit. Another key point in the exploit kit concept is that exploit kit authors uh, sell their exploit kits as a service. Software as a service or platform as a service, which is easy to say as an acronym, SAS or PASS. But when you try and make the acronym exploit kit as a service, it's uh, kind of hard to say that, right? So uh, you can say it phonetically, which just kind of sounds weird, or you can say it like I say it and say uh, EK ass and get slapped across the face. <laughs> So how much does it cost? Well, uh, usually uh, uh, anywhere from two to four thousand dollars a month, depending on the exploit uh, kit that's uh, that's being discussed. This image is taken from an advertisement. Um, there's a, a site called malwarebreakdown.com, and the guy there ran across an uh, advertisement for I believe this was called uh, at the time Nebula exploit kit. Back in March, he published this. So back in March, they were asking uh, their top tier package that would uh, hit any of the exploits uh, possibly available that it had in its arsenal at $4,000 per month. Seems like a lot, but I don't know. I don't deal in that sort of uh, large scale malware distribution, so I wouldn't know. Um, so how's a, how does an exploit kit work? Well, first, um, when a potential host is connected to an exploit kit server, they hit the landing page. Basically, when we say landing page, we mean the initial page that a uh, victim's computer will hit uh, when they connect uh, through web traffic to that website. The landing page will profile the victim's computer. The landing page will then figure out exactly what vulnerable browser-based applications are on the computer that is connecting, that is uh, communicating with the exploit kit server. And then it will send the appropriate exploit. If that exploit is successful, then the payload, which is the malware that's being distributed by the exploit kit, will be downloaded, sent to the system, and through the mechanism of the exploit kit, uh, through that particular exploit will infect the host and the victim will be none the wiser. But exploit kits cannot exist on their own. So uh, if I were to pay that $4,000 a month and set myself up an exploit kit server somewhere, uh, why would people even bother to visit it? Uh, you would have to set it up and kind of uh, either disguise the exploit kit server, which doesn't happen, or you could uh, uh, set up a system that will allow traffic to go through these uh, exploit kit servers. And that happens within an ecosystem. This ecosystem consists of actors, 
and campaigns. An actor, when we're talking about exploit kits, is an individual or criminal group behind a particular piece of malware. Now you'll hear uh, two terms used to refer to actors because there are plenty of actors in this theater of cyber war. Uh, we're all actors in that we're the good actors, the good guys. And then they have a term that they'll use, they'll, they'll call the criminals bad actors. And I don't like the term bad actor because it reminds me of 1960s era William Shatner on the original Star Trek television show. And uh, I recently tried to rewatch that through a Netflix subscription. And while I enjoyed the shows, they actually had a uh, much more um, profound effect on me as a much younger person. So uh, no, I don't like to call, I, I, number one, I don't really enjoy the the original series of Star Trek as much as I used to. And number two, I don't like to call actors in the theater of cyber war bad actors. I like to call them threat actors. The preferred term. So we have campaigns. So these actors are trying to distribute their malware and they want to do it through, they, they have to set up a uh, campaign in order to do that. When we're talking about exploit kits, we're talking about an interesting uh, situation. It's basically like laying a bunch of mouse traps all over the web that people during casual web browsing will stumble across, all right? A lot of people, when they look at campaigns, they think of uh, it in a military sense. I won't even go in the political sense here, but uh, in the military sense, you're organizing forces and you're planning objectives and you're, you're attacking stuff. And uh, when it comes to exploit kits, I don't like using the word attack. Yeah, you can, uh, you know, technically it might be an attack, but uh, if you step on a mousetrap that somebody had step, uh, carefully set out for you, uh, were you attacked by the mousetrap? You can say you were possibly attacked by the person that set the mousetrap, but uh, it kind of overlooks the actual mousetrap itself. A uh, campaign in the context of exploit kits is a system that consists of the exploit kit plus an infrastructure that directs potential victims to that particular exploit kit that you have set up. So if we look at exploit kit campaigns, here's a simple chain of events. You have a compromised server somewhere and these compromised servers are legitimate sites, right? They just happen to be not very well administered. They have some vulnerabilities that uh, somebody on the criminal side was able to uh, get into their server and set it up to where it will redirect traffic to an exploit kit server. They do this through injected code. So these compromised websites, every time you visit them, assuming the conditions are right, any page on that website will have injected code. This uh, script will uh, connect behind the scenes to the exploit kit and kick off that process described earlier. We'll try an example here. So this, uh, this page, the fecaltransplantfoundation.org is a compromised website. I checked it last night. Um, so if you're gonna go to this uh, fairly shitty website, <laughs> you'll find injected code. This is uh, from the pseudo, uh, I'm sorry, this is from uh, what we call the EI test campaign that was uh, first published about um, sometime around uh, 2014, uh, Malwarebytes, I believe, was the first organization that identified it as the EI test campaign. Basically because strings, strings in the uh, injected code, uh, one of them, they consistently had one of the string, the variable strings was EI test. Uh, they had since uh, long ago moved away from that, but the patterns of the injected script are still the same. And I've had people ask me before, well, how do you know that's the EI test campaign? And I can say, well, I just recognize the patterns. First of all, you got an opening and closing body tag there at the very beginning of it, which is odd. Um, and then the rest of the stuff, it just follows a pretty set pattern. 
It's like if you're learning a new vocabulary word and there's a string of letters that represents a word, how do you recognize it? Uh, it's through sheer repetition, right? You see this stuff often enough, you start to recognize it. Anyway, this uh, code, uh, um, as I checked this site out last night, yeah, I saw the injected code and uh, the traffic if I looked at the traffic, uh, here's a PCAP of the traffic filtered in Wireshark. I can look and I can find URL patterns that are associated with a uh, rig exploit kit. And in this case, I've, I've seen it off enough, I could recognize it last night at about, I'd have to say about uh, 7 p.m. Um, 7 p.m. our time here. It was 188.25.36.196 was the IP address and dsa.nipponbioenergy.com. The interesting thing about uh, the IP addresses and the domains used for rig exploit kit under this particular campaign is that the uh, prefixes and the suffixes will change quite frequently, usually about every hour. So if I were to hit this again, it could be another random three letter uh, prefix before Nippon Bioenergy. Now, I also had a setup of uh, Security Onion running, monitoring the traffic while I was infecting the host. And uh, um, I used the emerging threat, I used Suricata as the IDS engine, and I used the Emerging Threats uh, Pro rule set, which I currently have access to. In that case, you can see triggering on that particular IP identified. Uh, you've got Rig Exploit Kit. Um, alerts that are showing up. And then what you didn't see in the image before, uh, the particular payload by Reddit Exploit Kit in this instance was uh, a uh, piece of software, piece of malware called Quant Loader, which is basically just a, a loader that will load other software, other malware. So in this case, Quant Loader uh, loaded uh, something that's been identified as Z Loader or DE Loader which uh, generates a lot of Tor-based traffic and supposedly um, is a backdoor that can download additional malware. Some exploit kit campaigns will use a gate, which is just another server between the compromised website and the exploit kit server. And I used to call it a redirect because that's what it always looked like to me. It always looked like a redirect that would uh, take traffic from the compromised website and redirect it to the exploit kit server. But the technical term is a gate. So if we're looking at a gate in the uh, 1984 movie Ghostbusters, where Sigourney Weaver's character is uh, uh, possessed by the spirit of Zool, uh, she is the gatekeeper, and you got Bill Murray's character there, uh, representing, in this case, the user's computer. And she keeps asking him if he's the key master and at first he says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I forget the exact dialogue. But then uh, he eventually says, yes, I am the key master. So he actually, uh, um, he actually provided the right conditions to the gate for the gate to let him in. So that's what a gate does in this framework. A gate, all a gate does is check to see if it's OK to send a uh, uh, to send a particular computer that visited the, the compromised website and is hitting the gate to go on to the exploit kit server. Sometimes there's more than one gate. I don't really see gates much. I haven't seen gates much in the past, uh, um, in the past uh, six to eight months as far as exploit kit activity is concerned. And uh, maybe they'll make a comeback, but I used to see gates all the time. Um, quite frequently, uh, almost every day. Instead, what we're seeing, instead of necessarily multiple gates, is uh, malvertising campaigns. They're pretty big. So you've got, uh, you've got your blue guy there, who's the computer user, and is hitting a normal website, which is the smiley guy. And then uh, the, there's a uh, malicious advertisement, right? Or the advertisement, not even uh, necessarily is malicious, but the advertiser, the advertisement has injected code which then redirects usually to another iframe somewhere and then goes to the exploit kit. So uh, the thing about malvertising campaigns 
And uh, Magnitude Exploit Kit is where I see the, the vast majority of this malvertising happening. Um, I don't like them because I can never replicate them because they're usually short duration. So give me a traditional exploit kit campaign where you got a compromised website that's redirecting traffic to an exploit kit server. I can find that compromised website. They generally stay compromised for months at a time and I can regenerate that traffic. But uh, show me a malvertising campaign which has a bunch of stops in between and normally lasts for about one or two hours and then uh, moves on to the next thing. Um, I'm not gonna be able to do anything with that. Uh, because the, uh, the gate domains that pop up that are associated with these malvertising campaigns are generally very short-lived. Uh, short they'll, uh, they'll be registered and used and a day later they'll be gone. Or they'll, the domains will still be there, they just won't be used. Common exploit kits. Um, who here has an idea of what the most common exploit kit currently is as of 2017? Uh, rig, you are correct. Rig is currently, right now, by far the most common exploit kit that, uh, that I see on a day-to-day -day basis, on a daily basis. Uh, rig is also the one that's, uh, uh, what's the right word, not private. Uh, rig is sold to uh, a openly advertised on the underground market and uh, people are able to use it and build campaigns around it to distribute their malware. Magnitude Exploit Kit is uh, actually uh, um, what they would say uh, is private. It's just being used by one particular actor to distribute, I believe it's been server ransomware for probably well over a year now. Another one is Terror Exploit Kit, which is, uh, they should rename it, um, so the guy it has renamed it quite a few times trying to market it. Uh, Erdis Exploit Kit, uh, Nep Neptune Exploit Kit, Blaze Exploit Kit. Uh, since it popped up around January of this year, um, it's had like four or five names. Um, and I always like to call it what it originally was when researchers first started writing and discovered it. Um, but Terror Exploit Kit is a terrible exploit kit in that it's uh, it, it rips off a bunch of stuff from other people. It's, uh, it's shoddily coded. Uh, it, uh, it, it's like some clown decided to uh, get into cybersecurity and start writing stuff and couldn't, uh, couldn't quite keep the uh, 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 comedy and the error out of his work. Neutrino Exploit Kit is still around, but as of late last year sometime, I wanna say around October, November, um, September, October, November, somewhere around there, uh, Neutrino just like fell off the map. And uh, so at work, at Palo Alto Networks, um, I'm able to access a uh, bunch of uh, uh, certain types of customer data in order to search for exploit kits. And I will occasionally still see um, indicators that Neutrino exploit kit is uh, still out there and still active. But uh, I've never been able to find any actual refers and, being, and I've never been able to generate any traffic uh, myself after Neutrino Exploit Kit went private. Kaizen Exploit Kit, one that I mentioned earlier, uh, the one I generally see associated with uh, South Korean websites, compromised sites that are generating this traffic. We believe it's a Chinese act behind it. Um, that one, uh, I'll still occasionally see something, and this is a very old exploit kit. It uses, it still uses Java and uh, PDF exploits, and I never see that with uh, any of the other exploit kits. Two of the big ones last year, Angular exploit kit, which I think some of you may have heard about, uh, was 2015's number one exploit kit. Um, probably the most professional, the most advanced of them all. That disappeared in June 2016 when um, Russian authorities arrested criminals associated with uh, Lurk, Lurk malware, I believe. Uh, nuclear exploit kit, which was a big one for several years, uh, just all of a sudden disappeared in April 2016. And finally, as of last month, uh, Sundown Exploit Kit, which I think may have been advertised under another name before it disappeared, 
um, disappeared as well. Now, the interesting thing about Sundown Exploit Kit is it was uh, it used to rob, uh, steal, beg, and borrow from all the other exploit kits. So you might see Sundown Exploit Kit and mistake it for nuclear or neutrino or especially rig. So it looked a lot like rig in some cases, but um, it, it uh, rig exploit kit when it first appeared was, uh, and I'd always considered it like a, a mid-tier exploit kit, nothing too fancy. There really isn't anything innovative in exploit kits. Uh, and like I said, uh, we don't really see much in the way of zero day exploits anymore from exploit kits. Um, it was all, uh, uh, it's all kind of gone downhill in recent years. And I'll get more into that later. So uh, as I was searching for terror exploit kit, one of the things that I can uh, uh, do with uh, Palo Alto's particular vendor solution is uh, the thing that we're able to search the easiest for is uh, flash files. Because flash files, flash exploits I should say, when they're sent over the wire, they're usually sent in the clear, almost always uh, in every case. So when an exploit kit uses a flash file, it may be compressed, but it's still noticeably a flash file that we can get information from. So in this case, Terra Exploit Kit was uh, for uh, up until the 16th, which is the last time I saw a reliable indicator. It was on IP address 4577-3117 with a bunch of domains that ended with the uh, suffix, uh, the top level domain dot info. So to give you an idea of uh, what we're seeing, what I call the top three at this given point in time, that may change by the time next month comes around. Rig Exploit Kit saw 507 hits since April 1st. Magnitude Exploit Kit, the, the uh, private exploit kit, saw 169. And then way down there on the scale is uh, Terra Exploit Kit. Um, I didn't notice anything on Neutrino, although I have noticed a, a couple of hits here and there uh, this year. And there are other exploit kits like um, uh, Stegano, which I think uh, Trend Micro wrote about, which was a version of a, uh, it basically a new name for an exploit kit that has been out for a while, Astrum. That's it. I was trying to remember it. Uh, so occasionally we'll see indicators for some other exploit kits, but uh, they're not common. Rig exploit kit by far, by far, is the most common exploit kit that we'll see out in the wild. So if we're going to examine exploit kit traffic, uh, you'll have a few prerequisites. Um, if you, for example, if you want to set up a lab to, uh, uh, to generate exploit kit traffic on your own, you want to be able to look at it and see what's going on. Uh, first of all, if you're doing it work, you need to do it on a non-corporate network. Um, in many cases, this means using a uh, VPN, which is how I generally do it. Uh, when I, uh, before I started working at Palo Alto Networks, I was working at Rackspace. I could use a VPN to bypass the corporate network, uh, uh, infect as many hosts as I want, and then uh, it was only on occasion when I would uh, forget to put the VPN on that uh, I would start triggering alerts and people would go, ah, oh, that's Brad again, he's affecting another computer. But uh, yeah, it, by and large, you probably don't want to trigger uh, uh, malicious alerts on your company's network. If you're doing it from home, uh, VPN is also a pretty good idea just because if you have an infected computer on your home network, there are some forms of malware that might start scanning around and seeing if there's anything else that it can reach out to and touch and try and break into. And uh, finally, as far as a VPN service, um, when you're coming at a compromised website or an exploit kit, if you come from the same source IP address repeatedly, it will, in many cases, either the exploit kit or the website itself will not generate the code needed to complete that infection chain if you do it multiple times from the same IP address. So a VPN is good to say uh, uh, switch IP addresses and come at a compromised website or exploit kit from a different IP and be able to generate some traffic. 
You'll also need a vulnerable Windows host. It could be a VM. Uh, it could be a physical host. So I prefer working with physical hosts while I, uh, when I can. So in my uh, home environment, my home lab, I've got set up. I've got it set up where I could use a compromised host. Not necessarily for the exploit kits, because the exploit kits, while some of them kind of look for a virtual environment or security tools, it's usually the malware that they send that's very aware of its environment. You'll need a compromised website. And I'll get into where you can get that information a little later. And finally, if you're going to actually generate exploit kit traffic, you'll need a way to uh, actually capture the packets of that network traffic so you can look at it. The way I do it is uh, I, do it, I do it a number of ways. Um, Wireshark is probably the, the best tool to use for examining the traffic. Uh, use Security Onion as a way to set up an IDS um, so, I can generate, um, so I can generate traffic to uh, figure out what I've got if I don't know what I've got. Uh, Rig exploit kit for me by this time, I've seen it so often I recognize it on site. But uh, some of the other stuff, some of the malware, the post-infection traffic, I'll see something I've never seen before, and I'll uh, break out my security onion uh, uh, VM, I'll set it up, I'll replay the PCAP of the network traffic and be able to generate alerts and go, oh, okay, it's a Zeus Panda Banker or Quant Loader or whatever. But uh, you'll need to understand Snort or Suricata as your IDS engine. Um, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just use a, uh, just a regular uh, Linux host and uh, use dump PCAP or TCP dump to record the traffic before I do anything with it. So who has examples of exploit kit traffic on the web? Um, I know I do, but there are other people that, are, that uh, have within the past uh, year or so uh, kind of jumped on that bandwagon uh, for providing malware samples and uh, examples of uh, PCAPs of network traffic. Uh, one is the site Malware Breakdown. This guy's Twitter handle is dynamic analysis, at dynamic analysis, malwarebreakdown.com. Okay, this is a guy that uh, within the past year has been fairly active, fairly consistently, and uh, has a lot of interesting uh, and up-to-date things. He also has a little bit of a visibility into areas that I don't. So I always enjoy reading this guy's uh, tweets. always enjoy reading this guy's uh, blog post on exploit kit activity. Another one is uh, Zero Phage. Now this website, I had somebody told me, uh, tell me that this is probably the, the tackiest website devoted to exploit kit traffic that uh, he has ever seen. And he's right. It's um, aesthetically, you know, when you're trying to convey a lot of complex technical information, that uh, color scheme and that, uh, you know, all the, the fancy graphics and stuff is a little uh, garish, kind of distracts from it. Nonetheless, it's a good resource. Uh, the interesting thing is on the PCAPs that this guy provides, and I'm saying guy, this could be a gal, I don't know because I've never met Zerophage or the guy or gal behind Malware Breakdown. But uh, Zerophage's PCAPs uh, tend to be uh, run through a proxy, so they don't look, uh, they weren't recorded on the network like my PCAPs are that are fairly straightforward. Um, they look, those PCAPs look like they were recorded through a proxy. Another guy that uh, I've known for a while who I can specifically state is a guy is at Broad Analysis, whose website is broadanalysis.com. He has many examples of exploit kit traffic. Probably my favorite at the moment is someone in Japan who uses the Twitter handle at now underscore sec. Now the website I've got there, uh, this person, this Japanese individual does not, uh, does not have, uh, I think maybe has one blog post right now on how uh, he or she looked into exploit kit traffic, uh, an example. Um, 
the reason I like this Twitter feed is because uh, at NowSec will routinely tweet information on compromised websites that he or she has found that lead to exploit kit traffic. And uh, at any given time, I'll just check whatever uh, NowSec has posted on uh, the Twitter feed and uh, be able to generate exploit kit traffic. And of course, if you didn't uh, get my site, uh, my Twitter handle is at malware underscore traffic and malware dash traffic dash analysis dot net. So uh, I've got a lot of stuff on there. A lot of it's repetitive because I'll see the same stuff day after day after day after day. And um, interesting thing is when people are reporting on exploit kit activity or anything really, uh, generally if something new comes up, they'll report about it. Now, if it happens for 10, 12, 20 days in a row, you know, there may be a tweet about it or something uh, like that. What I'll generally tend to do is try and put out a, a full entry that provides new traffic examples and uh, new malware samples of the same activity as it keeps going on day by day. But um, there really is only so many hours in the day to do that. Some of my observations looking into exploit kit traffic is number one, exploit kit indicators are constantly changing. Um, I'd already mentioned earlier that reg exploit kit, those domain names change. Uh, the suffixes and the prefixes and the actual domain names themselves will change at least daily, uh, if not uh, more than uh, once or twice a day, and the suffixes and the prefixes will change uh, um, hourly. Legitimate sites and domains are frequently associated with uh, exploit kit traffic. So uh, just because the fecal transplant foundation.org is compromised and uh, generating a, a kicking off uh, links to exploit kits doesn't mean that it's not a valid site and that uh, you can hop on a Chromebook or something and uh, look at that site and get the information that you need. God help you if you need it. Ransomware is big. Andy talked about ransomware earlier. Uh, it was a very good talk. I was kind of trying to divide my time between the two talks, but uh, it's good that it's recorded so I can get a look at it uh, uh, and see your particular spin on it. Uh, a few of us have talks about ransomware. Ransomware is big. For a while, it was probably the by far the number one payload that I would see from exploit kit traffic. Uh, starting about mid-2015, it was always there. However, about a week to a week and a half ago, through exploit kits, uh, through rig exploit kit, which is the big one, I stopped seeing ransomware. Now I'm seeing uh, information stealers, quant loaders, uh, uh, even on the, the, the public, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the uh, mal spam, the malicious spam, mass email distribution, uh, where ransomware reigned supreme, now we're starting to see a resurgence in stuff like Drydex and Covter and some other families of malware that are not ransomware. So ransomware is big, but I think it may, uh, they may be falling out of favor, and we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks if uh, I start seeing ransomware back on the exploit kit side. Last month, security researcher Caffeine from the site malware don't need coffee. Um, he doesn't provide uh, PCAP examples or uh, malware samples. Uh, maybe he does on his malware don't need coffee site, but uh, he doesn't post uh, as frequently as uh, some of the other guys that I had already mentioned. Anyway, Caffeine uh, gave a tweet sometime back in March, and I can't fit it all on one screen, so I'm going to fit the top part and the bottom part. So on the top part, of this quad chart, he had exploit kit hunting. In 2012, people hunting exploit kits, it was kind of a desert. But by 2017, uh, we got a lot of people looking into this stuff now because it's interesting. I found it interesting because I started looking into it about 2012 when I started working at Rackspace uh, as a uh, SOC analyst and was really uh, finding out about this stuff and was going, oh, this is cool, I want to understand it more. However, the exploit kit landscape has done an inverse, right? So in 2012, the exploit kit landscape, uh, there were a lot of different exploit kits out there. A lot of different uh, uh, 
of actors in the criminal market that were selling exploit kit services. 2012 uh, was still the black hole exploit kit's heyday, if anybody remembers the term black hole exploit kit. Uh, 2012 was its year. It had been around since 2010, but 2012 was big, and it was like everybody was trying to copy the success of the Black Hole Exploit Kit. Now, by 2017, in comparison, is kind of a desert, because really the only huge uh, mass volumes of traffic that we're seeing from an exploit kit is only rig exploit kit. Everything else is by far uh, much lower in volume. Why do you suppose that is the case? Well, if we look at the browser market, we see that uh, Chrome is at 58.64% of the browser market as of uh, the last time I checked uh, earlier this month. I, I, I just Googled it. It could be a bogus site, but I'm gonna treat this as uh, the type of information that I've heard about before. Um, so Chrome, I have never been able to infect a machine through exploit kits using Google Chrome. Uh, don't know why. Or uh, you can make the guess uh, that Chrome is a better browser. Uh, Internet Explorer is just at under 19% of the market. Some of the, some of the exploits uh, that are applicable to Microsoft Edge have found their way into exploit kits, and that's at roughly under 6%. So take those together, a little under 25% of the browser market is a browser that's commonly exploited by exploit kits, right? And we're not even talking about the, the share of computers that are Microsoft Windows as opposed to MacBooks or Androids or Linux or... Uh, Internet of Things or whatever, that uh, a lot of lucrative markets out there right now that aren't Windows. So uh, the bottom line is exploit kits are really on the wane. So if you're just now hearing about exploit kits um, and uh, you're curious about them, well, it's not that they're not going to be around. They're just not really that much of an issue as far as in my case, uh, actual threat. If you're running Windows, run Windows 10, and you shouldn't have much of a problem with the current exploit kits that are out there. If you're running Windows 10, I would suggest you move to Linux or something, and then you wouldn't have to worry <laughs> about it at all. But uh, yeah, Windows 7, uh, really, you're, uh, you're rolling the dice security-wise if you're still running Windows 7, um, even though it, uh, from a user experience, the interface, it's much, much better than Windows 10. So what's your best defense against this waning exploit kit threat? Well, one is to back up your critical data. And uh, we already kind of went over earlier uh, um, in the keynote on uh, disaster recovery, right? So an exploit kit for some people could be a disaster waiting to happen, especially if you get hit with ransomware. Uh, so back up your critical data and make sure that you can access it if uh, you need to. So it does you no good to back up that data if you can't recover it, especially if you're in a business and you cannot afford downtime. If you keep your computers up to date and fully patched, that will really help a lot against exploit kits. Training and awareness is another one. Um, you can't properly defend against something that you don't know anything about. It works really well with phishing emails, but it also works as far as exploit kits. And finally, browsing restrictions. If you're on a corporate network, uh, you can have some sort of uh, proxy or some sort of uh, internet web filtering that will filter out specific types of sites that are prone to leading to exploit kit traffic. What types of sites do you think might lead to uh, exploit kit traffic? Shout anything. Pardon? <laughs> porn? Did I hear porn? Pornography, yes. Uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, that guy, Nowsec, uh, uh, the Twitter account, sometimes I'll check out these sites and uh, they have some really weird esoteric names. And it was like, ah, oh, it's a porn site. 
And uh, usually they're just not anything I would care to look at anyway. Um, so porn, gambling, gambling sites. Uh, so stay away from porn sites, stay away from gambling uh, sites, stay away from file sharing sites. So, uh, it, you know, it, illegal file sharing sites especially, but when you're talking about torrent type uh, sites where they're advertising the uh, latest uh, season of uh, 24, the X-Files or whatnot, and uh, you're downloading them for free, you're kind of opening yourself up to not just exploit kits, but uh, other types of infection vectors. So that pretty much does it. This is what we went over. And now it's time if you guys have any questions. Yes, sir. What about Facebook in terms of the sites? I know like, I've seen some of those like, redirect sites where you click on this link and it takes you to a really kind of seedy site almost. Like there's always ads and stuff popping up. Would you say have you seen any activity of that at all? I, yes, I have. A lot of times when I'm looking personally at Facebook, I'm looking on my phone. And then uh, I'll generally get something that uh, pops up that not an exploit kit in the case of uh, Android phone, but uh, it'll be you need to install this app. And uh, that's the type of thing where if I were looking at it on a Windows host, I could uh, almost guarantee you, you'd probably be redirected to an exploit kit at the worst or uh, at the best, you know, a similar type of site. But yeah, I, I've seen it happen before when I was looking at working at Rackspace, searching for exploit kit indicators and tracing it back to what ended up somebody being on Facebook and looking at a particular, uh, um, like top 10 list or something. yeah, something, something like that. that. I, all that stuff that's, uh, you know, basically a time waster. Any other questions? Have you seen any exploit kits that can get around software access policies? No. No, um, personally, I haven't seen it. I think it is uh, feasible, but uh, normally that's uh, that's software access policies are a good uh, a good method of just preventing malware in general. So, from the user's uh, app data local temp directory in a Windows 7 or a Windows 10 host, uh, there are certain conditions that you can set up with the software policy that would prevent your computer from getting infected, regardless of whether it's an exploit kit or uh, malicious spam uh, uh, word macro or something like that. But um, no, I personally haven't seen exploit kit activity that could bypass uh, software access policies. So that is a good preventative measure. I should probably put that up on the slide. Anything else? Sir? In, in the past, um, the kids had Uh, regex, yes, uh, but it also changes fairly constantly. So, for example, the emerging threats uh, uh, rule set, they'll generally keep on top of that. If, uh, if we go back, jeez, ah, here we go. So if you look at the dates on these, um, a uh, rig exploit kit landing URL, April 4th was the last time that they did a major change that they had to rewrite the PCRE for the rule detection on that. But uh, so it occasionally happens. The time before that, I believe, was March 13th, as uh, we see up there. But um, so yeah, you can identify them. Uh, a, a company like Proofpoint with the emerging threats uh, rule set, that's how they do it. Um, uh, the company I work for, Palo Alto Networks, has a different method of doing it. Now, I know you mentioned Proofpoint. Um, I've seen this in the past. Have you seen more of this where exploit kits are determining like where the refer is coming from? So if they're noticing where uh, a server is coming from, like AWS, for example, it wouldn't pass the malicious code any further. Do you see that yeah. sort of logic? There, there, are, uh, there are definitely uh, area-targeted campaigns where I will have to VPN from a European IP in order to get infected. Um, so I, I, I won't say platform specific, but uh, location specific. Okay. Um, I haven't seen anything platform specific, but normally when people are telling me, hey, I tried this compromised website, I wasn't able to generate the traffic, I will ask them if they're using a VPN and trying to get at it from a different IP address. And uh, uh, 
more often than not, they, they don't use a VPN and they're trying it from you know whatever home IP or whatever location that they're at repeatedly and they're not able to get it. But uh, yeah, there are some campaigns that are specific. Um, so I'm getting the wrap up for time right now. Uh, I'll be around so I can take some questions uh, if anybody has any for me one-on-one. -on -one. And thank you very much.